So anyway, mm. um, Prasud, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you. Um, just to get into kind of quick formal introductions. So you, well, in, in fact, I'll let you introduce what you're doing now. And also, could you just give a quick background because you've got some quite interesting changes that have happened recently. Yeah, um, so so I'm now with uh, Future Purchasing Consulting, FP Consulting. Um, uh, we're a procurement consultancy, uh, specialised in strategic procurement, all things to do with strategic procurement. Um, uh, but I've been in and around kind of industry and consulting most of my life. Um, I'm similar to a lot of people in procurement, kind of stumbled into it through various means. Um, but I've had a really kind of diverse s sort of trajectory to where I've got to now, which has um, given me some real reflective ability around the whole space of procurement and supply chain. Um, but at the same time, it, I've learned loads through just being on different sides of the fence and um, uh, also working in different industries as well. So, um, so re really, really excited to be with FP uh, right now. Um, and our kind of mission is to try and create the best procurement teams that we can possibly cr create, full stop. And um, and whatever that means, whether it's kind of capability, transformation, whatever that might, might mean, um, uh, hopefully it plays to our experiences as well. And so firstly, I think that's really exciting. And, you know, it's uh, it's obviously a big change from, or it's a, it's just, yeah, it's, it's a real um, kind of, you're making a real play on something here because you've obviously got, you've got something you want to take to the market. But do you look back at any of the teams that you've worked in? Do, do you take much from that in terms of looking at previous teams and going, wow, that was fantastic within that team. We had a great capability or we had really good leadership or we had a beautiful process in place. Is that something you can kind of take from some of the previous teams that you worked in? Yeah, 100%. And um, it's, it's the reason that I've kind of decided to take this step for myself as well. Um, I've learned from so many different experiences, um, sometimes where companies are doing things pretty well um, and then you're just trying to enhance what they're doing. Um, it could be a public sector or a private sector organization. But other times where, and this is the more common, more common type, where companies are really struggling with trying to get everything in order for them to transform or grow or develop or push, push the business in a procurement fashion. Uh, I, I find that space relatively exciting, working collaboratively with people in that, in that space. Um, and I don't think that I've ever seen a company or an organization with utopia when it comes to procurement. Um, I'd love for somebody to tell me what that company is, but I've, I've never seen that. Um, so I think there's always something to do um, in the space. And it's more a case of what's the right levers to be using on that sort of either transformation journey or capability building journey itself. So, yeah. So obviously, DB, your last role must have been, um, you know, a fairly um, large team globally yeah. um, within the function. Um, that's, you know, from a, in terms of the change for your approach to the market, what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, that must be, that's quite a big change really, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I mean I'm doing something very different to, to, to some degree um, uh, uh, with one half of my brain, which is, you know, we're, we're growing a consulting business and we are um, uh, working with clients of any type. You know, it could be private sector, banking, um, uh, FMCG, whatever it might be. Um, so having that diversity of kind of working with different industries is now a, the new fold that I'm in. But absolutely, DB, um, a complex organization, uh, um, you know, an age old institution that people know, um, and having to um, try and navigate what the complexities were of DB's needs um, from a supply chain perspective, but just kind of from an organizational behavior perspective as well. Uh, it, you need to put in the hard yards and you really need to get sort of under the hood to understand how you're going to potentially drive change in a place like DB. Um, uh, um, but it was massively rewarding for me professionally. I felt I felt like um, there was a lot of impact that you could generate. Um, and there's a great team there that's still kind of knocking about. So for, for us, and even in my new fold, um, empowerment is our kind of uh, way of thinking. And ultimately, we're not trying to take over what, procurement teams are doing, but DB have got an established, competent, capable procurement team that can take things into the future. And that, that's the, that's a really satisfying experience for, for me to have gone through and to enable that uh, to some degree. Absolutely. Yeah. And so from a consulting perspective, um, what's been your um, experience of that in the past on kind of both sides of the fence in terms of uh, that consulting attitude and that experience? Yeah, I, I think, um, 
you can be a consultant on the consulting side of the fence and you can be a consultant consultant on the industry side. Right, of the fence. That's right, my, right. Yeah, my, good my point. take on things, really. Um, uh, the, the model I would consider is, um, do you have the ability to bring in the best way of thinking into your organization to take them forward? And if you're in the organization, you're going to have to work with probably consultants or partners or open your mind up to thinking of the latest thinking or the most challenging thinking for you to move forward. Um, but if you're on the consulting side of the fence, <clears throat> um, you, you know, you're ultimately shaping that and you're, you're determining what new looks like for companies and for industries and for um, thought leadership in the market. So um, I think you can do it on both sides of the fence, but your your change management challenge seems to be more important internally, whereas on the consulting side of the fence, it's more about challenging the thinking from an outside-in perspective and helping be that kind of independent um, voice to what the internal needs might be of a DB or uh, anywhere else. And when you look at kind of like the, I don't know, the most well-known big kind of general consulting firms, how much do you feel that um, the people that are working within those organizations have got the industry experience as well, kind of in-house experience? Because I know obviously you've got great in-house experience. Um, is that something that, that you feel um, is sometimes lacking in the larger consulting firms or where they're just maybe pure consulting through and through? Yeah, I, I've worked with the, the, those big consulting firms, um, again, as an internal stakeholder to them or um, in partnership on the consulting side as well, or being in, uh, I was with Gempat, um, uh, so that was large, large kind of outsourcing consulting firm as well. And I think, um, uh, I think there's some really good people, really good people in all of these um, consulting businesses, um, and they always bring a different perspective to how you might need to move things forward. But I, I do take your point that um, if if you lack a level of uh, industry insights or industry know-how about how you need to move things forward internally um, and um, really understanding the deeper culture that might exist internally if you haven't been inside a company I think it's very difficult for you to experience that um, of course that doesn't mean that you cannot be successful it doesn't mean you have to go into industry to um, be successful in a consulting environment uh, I, but I do think it gives you that edge of being able to have a far more realistic conversation about what people are going through um, and also, um, you learn a lot from industry. Mm. Um, and I think sometimes the consulting world might always think that it's got the answers for, um, for you know, what a, a company or an organization is going through. But actually, the people inside um, uh, some of these companies have great attitudes and beliefs and leadership qualities that kind of really push through that change. And I think the consulting world can learn from industry as much as industry can learn from the consulting world as well. So. Yeah, particularly, particularly when you consider the last few years. So in terms of within industry, being inside a large organization, having to cope with the chaos and change that's happened over the last two, three years. Yeah. Um, that's been a massive period of growth, change, opportunity, uh, risks, all sorts of things to deal with within procurement. Yeah. So I think it's a really exciting time for you to be doing this, taking that forward, taking all of that experience forward into onto the consulting side of it to then benefit other companies from that. But there's a lot to think about. Um, it feels like it feels like procurement has kind of leapt forward in in a lot of ways. Like you were, you were saying earlier about is it the uh, was it a Sunday Times supplement you mentioned? But, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, and Johnny, you must know this as well from being on the kind of entrepreneurial side of the fence as well. Um, absolutely. I think um, there's the volatility of procurement, I think, that has to respond to changing supply chain needs or changing market needs. And then there's a the volatility of <laughs> entrepreneurship and yeah. and kind of shaping stuff. So, yeah, absolutely. Double whammy. Um, and, um, and yeah, you know, I'm, I'm really encouraged by um, uh, publications like the Sunday Times that have tried to bring the the um, the relevance and the impact of procurement and supply chain on the business world to the forefront of um, maybe um, the public. And that's that's only a positive thing for us in this space. Um, but it, it in, in particular, your point on volatility is is crucial. You know, there's this term VUCA um, that's being uh, banded around at the moment. I, I think procurement and supply chain are right in the in the crux of how to help manage volatile, you know, ambiguous environments in that VUCA space. And so the VUCA era, the VUCA era, indeed. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. Um, but, I, but but I'm re really encouraged. Um, I think if you've got an entrepreneurial mindset, 
generally. I think procurement is actually a good place to be. Oh, I was yeah. just about to say yeah. that. I think, you know, you, you, I tend to see that quite a lot. They're, they're the change makers, the people that are a bit more rebellious, the people that want to get things done. And when you, quite often the conversations I have are based around things like transformation. Yeah. You've got to have a bit of an entrepreneurial mindset to actually get anywhere with that sort of thing, haven't you? Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, you know, back to maybe my, my early stages of my career, I probably didn't come through the, the realm of people who study procurement and learn procurement and learn their sourcing processes and all that kind of stuff. I came through learning things on the job and trying and testing loads of different things, either in procurement or outside of procurement. And um, and it just happened to be that my, um, my kind of creative set of genes that were there were the things that really um, gave me the biggest kick out of working with procurement because there's so much diversity in um, uh, who you're dealing with and who you're working with. Um, uh, but I think, uh, so people who are probably uncomfortable with that entrepreneurship journey sometimes struggle in the procurement profession for what it is now because there is so much movement and so much um, kind of, up, so many ups and downs of how people need to operate. So if, you, if you're more process driven or if you're more kind of, you know, you're following a methodology um, and you're more execution focused. I think that kind of procurement professional is, is, is struggling to kind of keep up with today's demands um, compared to somebody who's coming in with a level of um, entrepreneurial sort of mindset, shaping, influencing, um, highly emotionally kind of conscious of who they're working with. Um, they're, they're, they're the kind of new traits for me um, uh, that procurement's moving towards. So because I, I was just going to ask you a question, actually. So, so when you when you're saying that, um, you know, there's almost like more opportunity within procurement. Do you think to to kind of expand that reach and build that up and influence the organisation in different ways? Do you think? Because I I think almost partly is that is that due to the fact that compared to some functions, procurement is actually a bit newer, and maybe it's a little bit earlier on the maturity curve. So in terms of what procurement is, there's almost like a redefinition of what procurement can be because of all these changes and all these opportunities. But also I feel like it's a maturity kind of evolution thing to a certain extent. Would you agree with that? Yes, I would. Um, I think uh, it, procurement, it's, it's true. Procurement is a newer function compared to other areas. And if it's come from a, an, an older purchasing kind of function or stock keeping kind of way of thinking to the more advanced elements of procurement that we're all um, now exposed to absolutely it's lower on the maturity curve lower on the history of of what it's done in terms of moving businesses forward um or organizations forward um but but i do think it sits on this kind of um gold mine of opportunity and yeah. and, and uh, n don't mean to say that in a financial sense but the opportunities are so vast in the procurement space if you look at the ability to shape um uh, the revenue or the innovation side of the business obviously take cost out the sustainability agenda which is growing further and further um there's not many other functions that have that ability to kind of um influence different parts of uh the, the company's strategic objectives yeah. really but you, you made a really good point about it's not going to come to procurement on its lap to help bring the bring, bring businesses and uh, organizations forward it's up to procurement to um, demonstrate where that opportunity is really sitting and have relevant conversations around what opportunity means um, as a result, rather than thinking so reactively in a demand uh, fashion. Yeah, because it's interesting when you were saying about the there's there's this kind of opportunity for people to be more entrepreneurial within procurement and for and for a more entrepreneurial mindset type of people to come into procurement. Um, when you look at the kind of future talent roadmap for procurement, um, you know, something that a lot of people talk about is the the need for people with greater data analytics skills and, and that, that kind of side of it, where through digital transformation, organisations are getting access to much, much more data. Um, and obviously, no point just having all the data. You've got to be able to use it and gain the insights from it. So it feels like there's almost, there's always going to be the core procurement requirements of being excellent at managing multiple relationships, communicating with different stakeholders, negotiation, all those kind of people skills that procurement need. Um, then you've got the entrepreneurial side of it and the strategic side of it. And then you've also got this analytical side of it. It feels like it's an interesting opportunity for the type of people that come into procurement to um, to kind of evolve as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
analytical mindset is probably also a, an important um, part of the, the skills portfolio that a procurement person will need and does need. And actually, I think a lot of procurement professionals have been analytical in their in their past, but the um, the multiple uses of data sets to drive insight or to help with decision making, that's, that's increased a lot more from just looking at spend analytics, for example, in the past, or um, maybe looking at the odd market report. Um, I think stakeholders tend to demand more intelligence nowadays to say, how are you helping right. me on my journey? So um, back to whether it's demand based, you know, this is what we spend at last, or this is what we spent last year, and this is what we think we're gonna spend next next year. I think if there's ways to shape data around opportunity and say, this is where we could be going from a growth perspective, because these companies are doing something else. Um, I think that's quite an exciting um, space. Um, but But I would also say, it's the the old adage of kind of not getting into data paralysis or analysis paralysis with yep. data and not trying to make make it um, become the be all and end all of where you're trying to get to using it just using it iteratively to help with your decision making is is important I would say yeah and I think you know um, you you mentioned the kind of diversity of opportunity within the procurement function I think there's also a real diversity of kind of mindsets and skills that are required and combined within w what the broader function um, offers. Um, I had an interesting conversation with uh, Ronnie Mora from um, BAT recently, right. and he's previously an engineer. So he's coming into it with a very structured, very analytical point of view. Yeah. And, and that's where, you know, this whole thing of people, how people come into procurement, there were, there were a real diverse range of opportunities for people with different skills that will be that will suit different categories and will also uh, suit different areas within that role but it all kind of comes together because it is quite a broad function you're not necessarily going to have you know just one type of person that can come in and do it all because it's it's quite broad yeah that's a really good good point um i think that's one of the things that excited me personally about um staying in in the space um i, I was from the heavy mining kind of manufacturing environment in my early stages of of my career and um, I was surrounded by engineers, quantity surveyors, um, uh, uh, financial people, sales people who had all migrated somehow into the procurement oh, profession right. okay. almost by, you know, <coughs> just because they'd been exposed to it or they enjoyed things like negotiation, whatever. Um, and, um, and I'm a social scientist by background. So, you know, just looking at the spread of the kinds of individuals, like you say, is, is um, it's, it's quite exciting to be around different people and you le then learn from different people and their approaches to how they look at procurement. Um, and um, and I think that is the beauty of, of this space is that um, maybe other, uh, other areas of business, there's a more traditional path to, you know, if you want to be an accountant, you've got to go through your accounting qualification. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, if you want to be a, a lawyer, I don't know, in, in I was in the banking world. We had lots of lawyers um, in the banking world. You had to have your vocational kind of um, badges to, to get there. Whereas I think because of that almost um, uh, multi ways of getting into the procurement profession, it's actually created more of that entrepreneurial spirit amongst people because there's lots of different things you can learn from. Yeah, and that uh, that must be quite exciting for you going in from a consulting perspective in the sense of going in, understanding how teams are currently functioning, what are the spread of skills and experience within that team. You're going to have, hopefully, in in team conversations, different viewpoints, which I always think is a really important thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, you said diversity of, of mindsets and diversity of thinking. Um, I think some of that comes from education and just the way that you've kind of dealt with education yourself early doors and how then you apply that to um, the, the business world. Um, uh, but but it is also um, personality difference as well. You know, if you've got people who are um, more analytical in nature, um, more process driven in nature, they can help with the discipline of procurement and really kind of keep the ri rigor of procurement be, be the engine behind, you know, um, let's say cost just for, for now and that cost discipline that might come through. And then you've got other people who might have been in, you know, more shaping capacities who are then helping with more strategic thinking and maybe the partnering of the business or the ability to look at a supplier differently and say, actually, this supplier is giving us far more than we can do ourselves. You know, all of those things, I think, um, uh, contribute to that kind of skills diversity. And it's, it's only a positive thing, back to opportunity. It's only a positive thing for procurement people to be a part of.
Yeah, and it, I think it lends itself to the potential for that kind of cross fertilization of ideas as well. And and from a consulting perspective, I get if you, I guess if you have the opportunity to bring teams together and encourage that, then that would probably be quite a rewarding part of it, I'd imagine. Yeah, um, I think again, traditional consulting has normally been come in prescriptive. You know, prescriptive. <coughs> here's a bit of a diagnostic. Here's a recommendation, and we'll do something for you. I think the consulting world's changed. Um, uh, a lot. If you want to be in a consulting environment, you generally need to be far more outside in thinking about your own consulting practices. Right. So rather than you rocking up and being, you know, Mr. Smart Consultant or Mrs. Smart Consultant, um, you really have to start thinking, well, look, there's a number of consulting companies out there, or there's a number of providers out there that help generate the best of breed thinking or the best way of way of operating. And ultimately, as a consultant, your purpose is to deliver client impact. It's it's for making sure your clients are going through whatever journey they're going through to get to where they'd like to get to. And if that is um, utilizing a multitude of companies or um, partnerships in a way of trying to bring that answer to the to the forefront, that, that that's, that's the how. That's the how that we've got to solve um, rather than feeling like we've got some kind of established way of thinking just from ourselves as a consultant based on it anything that we've done in the past it, it's got to be more more innovative in terms of how we bring um, solutions to the market as well i like it um it's it's the, it's the type of area that really gets it uh, it gets me thinking um i find it quite inspirational when you're looking at these challenges partly because i'm from a kind of i've got an entrepreneurial type mindset yeah. so i look at that and i go oh i like that that's yeah, that's yeah, interesting yeah. you can really get your teeth into that um so another thing i'm keen for us to uh, get our teeth into a little bit is Kind of following on from a conversation um, that we had at the eWorld mm -hmm. conference recently, mm -hmm. um, where I was talking about the kind of data gap in services procurement and, and where it is, um, you know, possibly um, left behind in some ways compared to other areas when it comes to digital transformation. Um, and we were just talking about whether or not the buying and contracting of services is a messy thing. With our kind of the, the, from the from the brief conversation we had at the time, it being kind of like, well, you know, what well, it is pretty messy, mm. and that was something that I thought would really be interesting to just discuss in a little bit more detail. So, obviously, you've worked in kind of like heavy manufacturing industries, but you've also worked in extremely services-led industries like banking. Mm. Um, what's your opinion on that in terms of whether it is a messy thing, and and if so, what that looks like? Yeah. Uh, I as a blanket statement, I'll generally say, yes, ser services can be messy. I think, I think as a starting point. Yeah. Um, uh, and it's, um, of course, there are better practices and worse practices, but, but yeah. generally it's a, it's a messy space. Um, <coughs> but I will also say that spend is generally messy right. <laughs> in big organizations. Um, you know, so um, if you're looking at goods and services, um, you, you normally, if you're in a complex business or complex organization, you, you're dealing with multiple business units, multiple jurisdictions, all buying in different ways. And so therein lies the challenge in, it, in its own right that you're, you're trying to aggregate and centralize a lot of that way of thinking as, as in, in, in many, many cases. Um, so therefore, starting point is it's pretty pretty messy. It's, it's complicated. It's, it's messy. complicated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then if you if you kind of drill down into that more, I think what what do, what do services really mean for a, for a business? So you, you mentioned the manufacturing side of things. In reality, services we probably looked at it at the time, you know, very much through the directs and indirects lens. And you know, directs was uh, this was back in my day at Tarmac, which was a part of the Anglo American Group at the time. And um, directs direct materials were typically you know bitumen and trying to um, uh, get raw materials into the supply chain. And the indirect side of things. We're pushing everything else up to that direct space, which could have been maintenance services. It could be anything to do with kind of um, construction and manufacturing, um, where you're using labor of, of sorts um, in, in that supply chain. So dependent on what your definition of services is for your business, that's also going to determine how complex and how messy things are. Um, uh, and, you know, you talked about, you know, on the bank, if I look at the other extreme in the banking side of things, most of the business model of banking is services driven, if you think about that. Um, and therefore services can sometimes traverse into the direct side of things. <laughs> That's what I was gonna say. I mean, yeah. it, um, 
uh, Naveen Amin was was talking about this with regards to like um, engineering consultancy. Mm -hmm. So basically, they're they're providing services to their own customer if they're in customers HS2, for example. But they've got a surveying firm they're acting as an extended part of their organisation that are actually providing those services. So those services are direct, and actually their indirect is buying goods like laptops, for example. So it's that's where the um, definitions are always really important in any industry. Um, but again, in procurement, because I feel it's quite an evolving space yeah. and there's so much complexity to it mm -hmm. because it's got to cover everything. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like the definitions, sometimes it's harder to have those as being something that's, it, it's never going to be uniform across sectors, industries, locations, different types of organization because people are buying different things, they're buying them differently, they're offering, they're, they're either offering a product or a service to the market in so many different ways. It's, it's, it's incredibly diverse in that point of view as well. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I think that that you cannot have a uniform definition of services. It, it's possibly unique to the industry that you're in, or it's possibly unique to the, the, the relative company you're in. Um, I, th I think as a as a professional, who, if you're trying to cut through what services and what's not services, yeah, you've just you've just got to recognise what what. Um, uh, you know your business model is really entailing. So if you are a bank or if you're a, a services-based company, maybe even a, a large consultancy, for example, and services are far more at the front of what you do, um, you need to know where you draw the, drawing the line on services compared to consumables or anything else that you're going through. So I think just having the mindset of knowing what services is um, is, a, is, a, is, a, is an important thing. Um, but back, you know, back to your point around complexity. Yes, I think it, it, there is complexity. And I think that the complexity is driven mainly by humans. <laughs> um, so well, quite often humans are very much part of that service, aren't they? So I always think of, you know, because a service could be wrapped up as like, I don't know, works, where it's, where it's a project where there are some goods and materials as part of it, but ultimately a supplier is delivering an outcome to an organization and it's their risk and they've got to deliver that outcome. They're not they're not necessarily delivering things that are easily measurable in terms of items and goods and objects. Um, so so in, intrinsically, when you're buying goods and materials, they are physical things that you can identify, you can weigh them, measure and them, look at them. You know, they are there and you can assess them. Whereas that services area is a bit more kind of intangible. Um, so it could be a very wide range of things, but generally there is a level of, um, human labor-based input, skill-based input, um, and and that kind of intellectual property involved with what it is you're purchasing. Um, and where there's people, it's always a bit more complicated, isn't it? Because it's never just as tangible as just a thing. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, and uh, that intangibility is in some ways um, trying to apply um, structure and um, outcome logic-based things to a quite a subjective area you know people are subjective generally um, of course you can you know there's there's far more um, cookie cutter or off-the-shelf kind of outcome based contracts that are wrapped around services nowadays but um, if services are increasing as an area generally that means that l mindsets are increasing or trying to translate what's going on in somebody's mind or a company's mind into a contract or into the, a buying behavior becomes more more complicated and it's harder to measure as a result so therefore trying to get the right thinking within a kind of process driven capacity i think it's harder when you've not got nuts and bolts or um, widgets and whatever else that you're trying to purchase yeah it was interesting i was reading an article recently talking about um the, the difference in value in what you're buying based on whether you're buying it on a, uh, in services, based on whether you're buying it on a time and materials basis or an outcome yeah. basis. Um, and up front, a lot of organizations will look at an outcome or output based arrangement and say, well, I'd actually I can't define that. Um, I, I, I just need some people to be working. Yeah. Yeah. Or they might look at an output based arrangement and say, it's gonna be more expensive. Yeah. But there are other things to consider within that. If you if you can't define what it is you need to get done to start with, even if you can't define the definition stage, yeah. then I feel like that's that has its inherent risks from a strategic point of view, in terms of well, what are you trying to do? Because it's very easy to have people working on something without necessarily a clear endpoint or outcome, and so therefore costs can run, and and therefore is it going to be more expensive? Whereas if you if you're getting a supplier to deliver something on an outcome or output basis. Yeah. 
they're taking risk for delivering something, for pricing it. Obviously, there's so much nuance to it. You know, even if it's an output basis, how is that priced? How is that structured? How is that changing along the way? IT projects, for example, often have iterations, sprints, whatever it might be. Um, but I think the world is, feels like it's moving more towards an outcome or output-based mindset in a lot of ways, just even if you look at the consumer world, mm -hmm. but also how that's transitioning to the business world as well. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, and I think the inherent challenge of services are that um, getting to outcome-based ways of thinking requires you to have um, a, a, a bit more um, forward thinking capacity, like you say, not a never ending kind of labor arbitrage or a never ending kind of body shopping of bringing people in and it's just captured in a statement of work. It's it's more about how would you see that service evolving over the course of time. Um, and I think some, some of that challenge therefore lies in, um, again, with big organizations that we're probably talking about big organizations here mostly, but in big organizations, um, the, um, the contractual landscape for those big organizations um, can sometimes be uh, a kind of shooting in the foot of that situation because they might have a large base, large scale contract, but the statement of work behavior or the buying of statements through statements of work is not really tallied up with that overall master services contract. And therefore the outcomes are, are mismatched as a result. And as a procurement person uh, or as somebody in the business, you're trying to ma marry the outcomes with the stakeholder needs. Um, but if you can't tally up what's going on in terms of the way you buy off your framework agreements or the way that you buy off the strategic things that you've been doing, you've been developing in the first place, then there's always going to be this mismatch. And that's, that's probably frustrating for stakeholders as well. That's a really interesting point. I like it because we're getting into some like fairly uh, technical uh, stuff here. So, so when you say there's potentially a misalignment between the MSA and the, and the statement of work, one of the things that we see a lot is that where organizations have these large MSAs in place with big providers, for example, big IT providers that are doing lots of projects for them, yeah. doing the strategic sourcing, they've got a really good handle on that. You know, they're using their source to pay suite to um, do the kind of supplier sourcing, the contract lifecycle management, the risk management, and put those master services agreement or framework agreements in place. But it's the complexity and the volume of the drawdowns, the call offs, where it is pulled into a statement of work, that's where a lot for a lot of people there's a dis disconnect. Yeah, um, and that's something that we in what we do we saw that quite a lot being something that was being worked on in the public sector. Yeah, back a few years ago where that was really being you know the the public sector frameworks that dealt with like consulting and professional services were really trying to get on top of this. Yeah, um, but that's a really interesting one. So do you when you say the the kind of misalignment do you mean in terms of what the objectives around an overarching framework agreement are versus what a statement of work is actually trying to achieve? Or do you mean kind of aggregating up the measurement of what's being done to, to look at the, the MSA? Because the MSA is obviously setting in, in, aside the terms, yeah. and you'd assume that most statements of work would refer back to those terms effectively, so they're working in the manner which, in which they should be. Mm -hmm. So are you talking more about what objectives are being achieved? Yeah. Um I might answer that question in a slightly <laughs> different way, Johnny. Not go to, for not it. To be a, a politician, but no, I think. But I think that um, th there's a, there's a, another starting point of that value chain, which is it's something that we found quite interesting ourselves. <coughs> and you mentioned strategic sourcing, but um, category strategy and where category strategy comes into the ability to think about sourcing and strategy as a whole. Um, that's a, that's a, a starting point of where maybe some of these behaviors get quite com complex. Right. So um, uh, some of the research that we, we've we done, I can't take any credit for, um, the team at uh, Future Person have done it historically, um, we identified that about 68%, so nearly 70% of um, spend uh, or value is unmanaged because we're not having strategic enough conversations with our stakeholders effectively. Wow. That's a high now, if you percentage. look at that, that's a high percentage. Yeah, absolutely high percentage, and um, that is a is is a starting point for buying strategic sourcing behaviours that might be up, more upstream. Um, so, if 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 the starting point is that actually we're not really having great conversations initially about alignment of objectives, alignment of what you know, if it's in a services capacity, alignment of what those services might be, there's a lot of value that's left on the table. 
Then you translate that into strategic sourcing or even into sourcing. And you're hoping that um, in that strategic sourcing phase, you're being um, uh, far more um, uh, kind of thought provoking around how to bring different services spend together under one umbrella. Um, but it's only going to be as good as the category strategy that you probably started with, which we know is probably value left on the table. So then you get to the end of your sourcing phase and you've got to a, a large MSA, large contract, and you build this large contract. You know, you feel like it's answering multi-jurisdictional needs across the globe. Um, you've covered all your bases in terms of the kinds of services that you want to deliver. You've got some measurability around it. Major negotiation, public sign-off, everybody's happy in the business and procurement have signed off a big deal. And then buying behavior starts. Right. And I think when the buying behavior starts, it's in some ways completely different to the strategic upfront contracting phase that you've gone through to try and architect the best deal for that business or for that organization. And then you're into the buying behavior of people just needing to get what they need to get right. and wanting to, um, it could be contr contract on major complex um, statements of work, which can be huge, you know, major outsourcing deals or major projects, whatever it might be. And the unless they are very aware of what has been done up front and they've strategically aligned stuff up front as much as they possibly can, there's always going to be a bit of a disconnect because the demands and the needs of the day will, will largely just take you down, here's the supplier, let's get our statement of work sorted. And I think that um, it's, it's incumbent on the kind of post-contract procurement professionals and post-contract business professionals to make sure that that MSA is coming together with that statement of work um, because some statements of work can be more complex than MSAs. Um, so there's got to be a level of dialogue that really kind of keeps talking about that, that connection between um, contracts. And um, and then that will help with the statement of work becoming far more um, uh, applicable, but also efficient with um, the way that you want to work because you're not having to reinvent the wheel in the statement of work world, um, but you're seeing it as a natural extension of maybe the hard work that you've done previously. Um, there's probably another school of thought, thought around that as well uh, in terms of why do you, why do we need state, um, large MSAs? You know, is there a real need for large MSAs or should we be focusing more on actually really well thought through statements of work that answer business needs um, because they are where the services happen, where the, the actual delivery happens, so to speak. So I think there's, there's, there's a, a connection that procurement needs to help enable with that value chain and making sure it's coming right from the stakeholders all the way through to the delivery through the actual statement of work itself. Yeah, so you've come out with some really interesting points there. I'm just making a few notes here. So there's quite a few of them. So I'm going to try and kind of go back through sure. it. It's a good thing I make notes because I literally would have uh, gone from, hopped from one to the one to the next and then forgotten all of them. Um, I made a note of a phrase here, flow down. Mm -hmm. I feel that flow down is just an absolute critical part of this. So the flow down of those terms from the MSA to what's being contracted and what's being delivered and procured within the statement of work, clearly that's absolutely critical. But the other area of flow down that I think is, is super critical in this is just the flow down of strategy. Mm -hmm. So for example, the strategy might not be flowing down effectively into even the MSA yeah. um, or into the originating category strategy. But then when you look at it on another level, is the category strategy flowing down into how business users are thinking about it? It's all got to connect up, really, hasn't it? Yeah, I, I think you, you've, you've hit the nail on the head there. Um, uh, th there is a, a, a common um, behaviour that I've seen, um, certainly when I was in uh, the banking world, but also in other worlds, where um, you get really caught in the, the um, service level agreements and, and KPIs or key performance indicators of what's going on in the contract because you think you've got to make sure that if somebody's transacting off that contract, it's always pinned back to some measurable thing. But a but actually, what's more important is what you've described, which is what is the strategic objective of that service area or of that category or of that um, business division or business unit? Are you meeting the relative needs of where they're trying to get to in terms of how they want to use services or any other kind of spend behavior? Um, and that's regular dialogue, regular kind of discussion around it that probably sometimes needs to use the contract as an instrument of mimicking what you've been talking about with strategy. So flow down is a good, a good term, uh, I would say. And 
but it's ex it should be extensive, as as you mentioned. It should be that you are fully clear on what the business needs are from a strategic point of view, and you're also clear on the practical elements of how that can work in terms of just getting on with purchasing and sourcing and buying services accordingly. Um, but I, I see a lot of um, uh, mismanagement of the strategic space uh, um, in that flow down, for sure. Yeah, it's definitely something that that, that kind of comes across in, in conversations that we have where we hear about these types of problems. I think when you mentioned about like post-contract dialogue, I mean, in my experience, when it comes to services, post-contract is where the big gap is. So organisations are pretty good at putting a contract in place. But firstly, and I'm always harping on about this, but in terms of capturing those contracts or those statements of work digitally, most organizations are incredibly bad at doing that. Yeah. Typically, you'll end up with a scanned in PDF that's stuck in a, in a file repository somewhere, and that's it. Yeah. And that might have some outputs or milestones against it. They may change during the project. They may be measured against, they may not be. But it's, it's not a neat process. I always have this kind of neat and tidy mentality of thinking of things tying up along, along the way. Yeah. But, but talking about that post-contract dialogue, is such an important thing for that connection between procurement and the buying stakeholder to ensure that there are strategic objectives involved in it. It also ties into the pre-contract phase where the actual requirement is being defined because that's one of the things about creating an outcome-based agreement. One of the most difficult things is actually designing what the outcome needs to be before you've actually got into it. And as I say, that that sometimes needs to change along the way, but that's services contracts are designed to flex and change along the way. Um, and I think... Clearly, if a buyer is, is buying something, a technical service, the buyer might have a good level of expertise in it. They might not. The supplier definitely will have or certainly should have. Um, procurement probably won't. So they will, they will understand, they will have a broad understanding of it. But what procurement can provide is the kind of guidance around structure, content, and the strategic direction of it. So I think it kind of plays into how different organisations work from a cultural perspective in terms of how hands-on procurement are, how much they get involved. But there's a lot of value that can be added and that the business does need to be added in terms of ensuring that there's a strategic focus to a project that's being carried out. Yeah, Clearly, it's going to be more, more or less important depending on how much that project's worth. But um, a lot of this stuff goes on where it's just, as you say, the business user is just reacting to the, I just need this now. Um, and I think some of that can get left behind. Yeah, I, 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 th I think you've you've captured that pretty well, actually, Johnny. And and what it's made me think about is um, what seems to get caught up in that in that kind of connection problem between procurement and the business, or pre-contract and post-contract, is is roles and responsibilities. Right. And um, ask I'd ask a challenging question to most organisations: Who owns spend? Who owns your services spend? Is it procurement? Is it the business? Who owns the contract contracting process? Is it procurement? Is it the business? Um, once you get into that kind of level of challenge, you probably start having a, a far more healthier conversation because what you described is is procurement become the facilitator, the methodology, the the um, the uh, in some ways the consultancy to the rest of the business of how they help advise and shape and um, facilitate that progress for the business to reach their outcomes that they're looking for in, in terms of um, buying behaviours. But the, um, but the uh, business stakeholder um, uh, is really the owner of the delivery of that work, but they could be brought in far earlier into that cycle of definition with procurement so that they're becoming an integral part to it and they're not just seeing as a transactional partner at the end of... The procurement value chain that instead they're seen as a kind of you know a, a mutual uh, implementer of what that might be in the in the earlier stages and i still think that roles and responsibilities around the contracting and buying of services is is fragmented and not not um challenged enough or articulated enough in terms of who should who should play what role in making it work yeah i like it and just thinking back to um, you mentioned about your your, your university studies in social sciences. Mm -hmm. So when you were talking about the category strategy, yeah, and then this other thing coming into play called buying behaviours, mm -hmm. that must be that must have relate quite a bit to some of the stuff you've done in terms of it, it's it's a lot of it's like human psychology and social practices, isn't it? In terms of how these things occur. Yeah, it's fair fair comment, really. I, I think you know I I don't approach um, 
the way I look at procurement from an engineering mindset or from uh, a hugely technical mindset, actually, um, uh, it, for me, it's more about a network of connections. And um, and I think that is within procurement, it's outside of procurement, it's with suppliers, um, the, the whole gamut that you can imagine um, around that. And, um, and for me, a, a lot of that is about alignment of objectives between one stakeholder and another stakeholder and trying to get on a similar page of sorts, which is a far more socially driven, um, a behaviorally driven conversation as opposed to a technical conversation. Um, so I, d I do think it, it, it probably emanates somewhere from my from my uh, earlier life, but um, but for sure it, it translates into for me into um, exactly what procurement is exposed to on a day to day basis um, in that space. Yeah. Ultimately, it all comes back to what's the business trying to achieve, and how is that reflected in these individual departments and individual buying stakeholders in terms of what they're trying to achieve that plays into their particular contribution to that overall objective. It's just <laughs> the strategy and the communication of that strategy is so, so important. And like you say, it's not a, um, a mechanical process. In some ways, it's a very social process in terms of the communication of that. I mean, you know, we talked about entrepreneurial mindset, you know, startups, scale up businesses, they have to communicate their strategy effectively. They can't have any inefficiency. You have to have everybody, you know, rowing in the same direction, but buying into where you're trying to get to, buying into the objective, the destination. Um, and that's where you can get people with different backgrounds, different thought processes, different input, adding value to that process of trying to get to, to, the, to the destination. Because it's just, you've got to consider all the different factors. So that, 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 that's something that, for me, is a beautiful thing as a someone with an entrepreneurial approach. It's critical, mm. and obviously, the bigger and the more successful companies get, it can kind of get watered down and lost. And like you say, these organize these big organizations are incredibly complex yeah. in many different ways. But um, the 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 factor of this kind of concept of of the roles and responsibilities and where where do things sit, I think it's a much more open conversation than it was. And I think procurement are in a better position to kind of to a certain extent kind of push that conversation in some cases um but when you look at the process of, of of what it is trying to define what it is you're trying to buy and then trying to you know contract with the best partner and then trying to deliver that effectively that bit at the beginning is so critical yeah and and there's a real collaboration opportunity there because i think in a lot of cases buyers it's like you try and get people to write a job spec it, it's people hate it. It's hard enough. It's hard enough. Yeah. Trying to write a scope of work is even harder. Yeah. You're getting really into the, what, what is it I've actually got to do? How do I actually define that? But it's a it's a critical thought process. If if a, if a department is trying to do something properly for the company, if they haven't thought about that effectively, then that is a concern. Now it might be that they look at it and just go, well, this is not my area of expertise, which is why I want to bring in expertise. But there's an opportunity for collaboration as well where they could be collaborating with a single supplier or multiple suppliers to try and define a requirement. And we see organizations, um, you know, from a technology point of view, they're not necessarily just running um, uh, opportunities, tenders. They might be running expressions of interest mm -hmm. where they're just like horizon planning on what, what capabilities they've got within their supply chain or actually looking ahead and going, these are the types of problems we've got coming up. Mm -hmm what type of solutions do people see coming towards them? So I think there's a huge opportunity for collaboration and defining what outcomes or what, what the direction needs to be. Even when it's with suppliers, I think procurement have got quite a big role to play yeah. in helping coordinate that and, and kind of guide the process. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, uh, back to this kind of, it's a network of connections really. Um, I. I, I whether it's the contracting process, whether it's the, the alignment process, it's for me, it, it, procurement is at the center of multiple stakeholder discussions. Yeah. And and if procurement's not really in listening mode too much, it maybe loses out on the nuggets of what the business needs versus what the supplier can offer versus where procurement can play its role. Um, so so I think that there's, um, there's a, a, a real opportunity for procurement to become uh, less at the forefront, but more in the kind of advisory capacity of a business's um, ability to move forward without internalizing thinking too much within the organization, but externalizing it a bit more to help push things forward. Yeah, I mean, procurement have got so much information because they sit at this juncture 
with all these different departments and all the kind of internal data, but also the external information exactly. that a lot of other departments just don't have. Yeah. I always think it fascinating, particularly when you look at it from a consulting perspective. If you're a consultancy category manager or you're, you're managing those type of arrangements, you're, you've got this kind of like multi-directional view on what's happening. You've got the internal stakeholder view of this is what we need to get done. The supplier's doing a good job. Well, actually, the supplier's doing a bad job because of X, Y, and Z. And then you've got the supplier's viewpoint on what needs to be done, how it should be done, and actually their view on internally how the stakeholders are supporting it. Yeah. Because from a consulting perspective, your job could be made very difficult if the internal stakeholders aren't supporting the process. You know, they're, they're letting you down. They're not providing the right information. They're not doing their part. It's um, you're really at the kind of fulcrum of a lot of information. Yeah, fulcrum's a, a good a good sort of def definition of that. Um, and and you know, category strategy. Uh, or strategic thinking, um, that's probably you know twenty years old, maybe longer, thirty years old of of um, trying to have a strategic alignment with the business, and make sure you're having that upfront conversation um, where you're bringing those kind of multi um, multi stakeholder needs together. Um, but then we've kind of moved more towards business partnering, and business partnering, whether that's through category strategy or it's independent business partnering is exactly what you've described. It's that ability to hold hold together a set of needs from multiple angles and then try and work in unison around that business partnering set of objectives or business objectives through a mindset of partnering more with the business and bringing all of those rich data sets and informations and people and um, institutions together um, so that you're getting the best out of that kind of integrated business needs conversation as opposed to, you know, here's some demand and this is where you need to get to or here's where we can aggregate, this is where you need to get to. It's, it's, a, it's a far more enriched conversation through that business partnering kind of um, uh, uh, dialogue that you get. You know? And do you think that's appreciated to the level that it should be within most organisations out in terms of other parts of the organisation, whether it's the C-suite or just other functions, appreciating that? that role and that opportunity with procurement yeah i think i think I, i've maybe used this term in some other lives before but i think procurement's going through a bit of an identity crisis right and so to your point i don't think it's appreciated but also procurement sometimes feels like we're the forgotten stepchild of business um and at the same time um procurement uh, uh knows it's the one that probably can help facilitate those conversations. So sometimes it overcompensates right. um, for its ability to say, do you know what, we need to be at board level conversations or we need to be the most strategic thinkers that are pushing stuff. I think um, trying to drop a level of ego in that conversation of a procurement professional of, or the CPO in their, their organization is important. And just becoming a bit more of that facilitator role, a bit more of the, the conduit to bring those, those areas together. And that starts with, have you even spoken to your key business partners about what their needs are? Just just generally in a in a non kind of prescriptive procurement fashion, but ge generally in that kind of, what it, what do you need? And let me understand what you need generally uh, from from your um, delivery requirements. But getting into a, a healthy dialogue around that, um, and I think that people who start with that conversation more so have already started the business partnering dialogue. Now you can amplify that. You can amplify that through far more structured facilitation of bringing multiple stakeholders together, multiple business units together. Um, but by starting that, you're, you're, changing the, you're changing the game of the conversation, less to a sourcing approach, less to a kind of buying approach, more to a needs analysis approach. Um, and, and also allowing for a level of challenge. If demand is this, and everybody think it, the business thinks th what they need is what they should get, but you recognise as a procurement professional that you can shape that demand through different ways by engaging suppliers or engaging other other places. You you, you, you give yourself that opportunity to have that conversation more in a business partnering conversation, um, but it does require you be, to be able to build relationships with your business <laughs> um, that are not around procurement and. Um, you know, some organisations structure themselves accordingly. You know, you might see in uh, either financial institutions or uh, maybe even technology institutions, vendor management offices, right, that kind of set themselves up to try and become that conduit between the business and procurement. But that doesn't always have to have to be the case. Um, you know, you can abandon the notions of being a traditional 
sorcerer or strategic sorcerer, just put that language to the side and then um, just say, you know, you're part of the procurement and the external engine that, you know, brings suppliers to the fore. Let's have a conversation about what your needs are and how we can match that. So, so it doesn't necessarily need to be encased in like a formal doctrine as such. It's, it can be... Because um, yeah, I had a conversation with Simon Gill uh, recently, and he raised an important point. Which he, his kind of his kind of concept is: if you want to be at the, at the if you want to be at the top table, make sure you've got something to say. Yeah. So it's not just about procurement having a right to dictate this or that, um, or take an approach of just this is this is the procurement way of doing things. It's about having those conversations and building up those relationships, and so that so that the story can be told to kind of sell the opportunity into the business, but also but get suppliers to buy in and, and get stakeholders kind of understanding that value there. There's so much of it's around communication. Yeah, and I liked what you just said there about um, having something to say. You know, uh, procurement people shouldn't really be generalists. They should know their, their trade uh, back to trying to bring the best of everything into that one conversation. Um, uh, so you you want to, I think in those conversations, you want to be seen as a an intelligent procurement professional who is coming into that conversation with bringing those things together. Um, uh, and that therefore allows for you to have a, a wider conversation with C-suite stakeholders or with um, anybody else that you're, you're dealing with on a needs basis. Um, uh, but if you, if you come with a prescriptive way of thinking from the outset, it's just not, it's human nature. You're going to get your back up if somebody says, well, here's my seven-step methodology or here's my framework, here's how we're trying to aggregate X, Y, and Z. Um, structures always, can always be appreciated if there's no structure, but um, that informality of conversation to start with is probably a, a good starting point. Um, and we should learn a lot from the sales community in that regard. People who, are in that, who have either, either had experience in sales or um, been on that side of the fence. Um, it's a mix of formal kind of sales development and it's a mix of informal sales development and a lot of it is just about relationship building um so you can skin the skin the the cat in in multiple ways in in that yeah. regard um and but it does require you to have just a bit more of a, a humanized um authentic conversation with your stakeholders not something that is just about we're in this function you're in that division how do we meet your needs kind of thing yeah exactly yeah. i think your your reference to kind of the sales side of it is very is very true because um, if you don't have these conversations, you're never going to fully understand the problem. And from a sales perspective, a commercial perspective, you always need to understand that what is the problem that, that, that the, the end customer is trying to solve here. Um, so, you know, procurement could go into those conversations thinking, I know what the problem is. We've got our, we've got our structure. This is you just need to follow process. But actually, there's nuance to it. And in those conversations, there'll be an important thing to understand, which again feeds through to that overall company strategy that then procurement are driving towards that as well, because that communication is going down through these different departments. Procurement know what their role is within the overarching organisational strategy. The buying stakeholders know what their department is trying to deliver and how they're contributing to that overall strategy. But, but procurement might not have a particularly good understanding of what that department how they're trying to deliver on that strategy and what their objectives are yeah if they're not having those conversations yeah I agree um I, I draw quite a few parallels between procurement and hr um uh, and uh, you mentioned extended workforce yep. um, uh, earlier and i think um uh, not just from a buying behavior so statements of work you know you, where you're buying people um through hr and you're having to buy people through um through procurement but the the extended workforce com concept for me straddles both and actually if you look at procurement we've got a bigger lens on that extended workforce than hr do yeah but we're, we're kind of looking at things in a similar way we're looking at trying to get the best out of the people that join this organization and increase the performance i feel exactly the same that procu of procurement's intentions to some degree um so think about the rigor and the um the level of thinking that happens between a HR professional and their stakeholders in terms of getting the right talent in or you know, making sure that the performance of a team is working. Why would procurement not have that same level of dialogue in a way that is really performance driven, but trying to get the best out of our suppliers and the multiple people that might exist in that supply chain as a result? So um, I, I see massive parallels. I've always seen that through my career, but it's, it, it's interesting how little those functions 
tend to talk about the similarities um, between them as well. Yeah, it's all about understanding, isn't it? Getting to the heart of it, and, and ultimately you're dealing with people. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a it's a very interesting parallel. I think one of the things that um, uh, I had a really interesting conversation with uh, Georgina Jones. Um, it was quite a while ago now. Hopefully, um, we'll be able to catch up again soon. But mm -hmm. she was talking about just capability and capacity. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, if you look at uh, if you look at an organisation. Uh, whoever is you know ultimately responsible for that organization just just needs to know what what um what are all of my available resources and what is the most effective use of all of those resources that I have at play internal resources external resources different departments how it all interplays it's it's kind of one organism it's just a it's just an extended um, extended organism so that overall capacity and capability needs to be managed to a certain extent in the same way that you would try and manage the external versus internal. Exactly right. Um, we talk about capability and capacity a lot, actually, um, through FP. Um, and, and actually, those two axes are exactly the same axes that we have on the procurement side of things with the HR side of things. If you really look at it, they might be, they might be sliced in different ways because capacity through procurement could be vast. Yeah. You know, major outsourcing agreements or major kind of look at a global business services um, need for a business where you effectively outsource your entire um, headquarters or your um, your back office functions or your middle office functions. That is a massive extended workforce cap capacity conversation. But within that is a whole dimension on capability that is, are you bringing the right kinds of people to support that organization through procurement or through an outsourced function? Likewise, it's, it, you're having that same conversation, maybe more intimately through HR, because it's you know you've inherited, you know people that you've recruited, and that's part of your core core business. But I would say that there's very similar very similar dimensions on both sides. Um, yeah, it also ties into that kind of future planning, horizon planning, whatever you want to call it, where you're you know within your um, workforce, you're looking at grad schemes or apprenticeships or just kind of outreach where you're starting to think about what are the future roles this organization is going to need to have. Um, exactly the same with supply chain, which I think is very interesting when you look at the lack of visibility of the supply chains that some organizations have. Yes. Um, I mean, things like sustainability scope three, for example, is increasing, is another angle on why organizations need uh, visibility of their supply chains, of which I think is sometimes the visibility is can tend to be naturally better in the goods and materials on the goods and materials side of it than the services side of it. Um, obviously, not always going to be the case. Sure. Um, but just understanding capability, again, that ties into it because you know you look at and just the opportunity to engage with smaller, more innovative suppliers, things like that. It can kind of get left out if that information is not being captured properly and that visibility is not available across the organisation. But it's so critical, and it's only going to get more critical as organizations need to adapt faster, new things come along. And again, it's, it's, it, it ties into the, the HR kind of comparison you mentioned there. Um, you also mentioned um, axes on capability and capacity. Apart from that giving me mild PTSD when I'm thinking about <laughs> yesterday when I was trying to help my daughter with quadratic equations and graph insertion points, that, which literally gave me flashbacks to that. That's a really interesting one when you talk about the, that axes. Um, so, so does that apply? How can that be applied to, for example, category strategy? Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe to qualify my thinking, it, it wasn't to do with the quad quadratic equations. Okay. <laughs> Honestly, I don't ever <laughs> want to think about it ever again. <laughs> but, but I think um, to qualify that, um, uh, in simple terms, capacity is, is have you got enough fuel in your organization to deliver against what your needs are? Have you got enough, enough there um, so that you're not constantly um, looking at an absent bench of capacity that's there. Um, and capability is, is are you doing the things that you want to be doing as an organization um, and then building the competencies behind that to make that successful? Um, and, and I think in, in the, the procurement world, um, back to capacity comes through your extended supply chain. Yep. And capability comes through your extended supply, supply chain. Um, uh, so there's there's so much there's so much I think it's more than the the, the realm of HR uh, not to knock HR um, but it but it it's more than the realm of HR because of that supply chain visibility um, um, and tiering that you that you go through in procurement um, 
and uh, the multiple services that are rel reliant on other services or the multiple companies that subcontract other companies, et cetera, et cetera. So I think um, trying trying to um, apply that lens, it's probably not the, the, the priority of uh, when you're procuring or setting up an agreement with the service providers in the supply chain. It's probably not a priority to think about capability and capacity all the time. But if you can bring that to the forefront, you then start having a much more strategic conversation alongside your HR function. And you start, maybe, maybe there's, I'm probably thinking out loud here, but maybe you're thinking about, um, uh, well, what are the what are the talent objectives that you have in your HR function? What are the talent requirements that you push through why wouldn't you replicate that in the supply chain um, in terms of that capability capacity thinking? Um, so why wouldn't you look at trying to get the best out of supplier X because they've got great talent that comes through that's, that augments what we have or we can't build internally? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a really interesting parallel. Uh, I could talk about it for days. So. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I totally agree. I, th I think, you know, in terms of my particular kind of subject matter expertise, it's generally around how organisations get work done through different means and ultimately yeah. kind of how they use technology to get work done. Um, and it's, yeah, there's so many crossovers with it. In, on the services side, I find it absolutely fascinating how organisations manage it, how they view it. Um, but I've, I've not heard anyone kind of bring up that HR procurement comparison before, but I think it's a very valid one. It's, it raises some really interesting points. Mm. Um, so, so in terms of the kind of hot topics that you're looking at at the moment moving forward, um, what, what are the areas, I mean, we, we've spoken about some areas there that are extremely critical, problems suffered by a lot of organisations and some quite core, core issues there. What are the sort of um, hot topics you're looking at at the moment? You mentioned um, the kind of category strategy type approach and you also mentioned like business partnering. What Are those areas you're seeing coming up a lot or looking at and what other areas are you kind of focused on at the moment? Yeah. Um it's, yes, we have talked about business partnering. It is, it is an area. And it, whether business partnering is standalone as a kind of discipline that you want to build a function around or you want to make it as part of category strategy, um, the concept of business partnering for us is really important um, uh, tool for better conversations and better outcomes uh, with, with um, stakeholders. So that's one area. Um, we also just touched about touched on capacity and capability, which is for us around our operating model um, way of thinking from a procurement point of view. So um, uh, to maybe just dissect that a little, um, uh, design, designing an operating model for your future capability is crucial. So if you're a procurement professional CPO or trying to set up a procurement function and you're designing your operating model in terms of how you wanna work with the business, how you wanna work with suppliers, how you wanna bring in the right talent in your, into your organization, um, uh, what are the things that you need to go through? What are the things that you need to question in terms of getting that model right to start with? And that's really a precursor to then recruiting and designing your organization of, you know, we need category managers, we need um, uh, uh, contract managers, we need supplier relationship managers. Um, you know, before you even get into that, uh, we, we're, we're looking to apply a lot more thinking into the debate of, Where's the organization's value and what's the operating model that needs to talk to that organizational value from a procurement point of view? Um, uh, so that quick quick question on that. Yeah, sorry to, sorry yeah, to interrupt you. Yeah. So with those operating models, how yeah. how structured and formulaic is it, or do you see it as in terms of choosing from a range of operating models to suit a particular need versus how organic is it? Yeah. Is the process? Uh, uh, like anything, operating models not a, a new concept for business or even in shaping an organization's needs. So that, that having a level of, of method behind it, you know, there's certain things that you're always gonna keep in a, an operating model framework, like um, strategic objectives, are you aligned with that? Processes and technology, have you defined that? Um, interactions between different things. They're all kind of core concepts of divide, uh, devising a, um, an operating model. Um, I definitely wouldn't go into an operating model discussion prescriptively with an organization because um, there's things that uh, organizations can learn from other organizations about how they might have set up operating models that can leverage those things around strategic objectives, process, tech, uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, but normally an organization is going through its own unique value chains of sorts and also its own unique, only, um, 
unique only interactions with key stakeholders or with key suppliers. So you, the operating model conversation for us is more about getting to the heart of what's your overall organization's goals? So is revenue the main driver or is growth the main driver or is you know, um, cost optimization the main driver? Really aligning to what those strategic goals are. Is sustainability the main driver? Um, align to those goals and then trying to shape an operating model with some of the, some of the method that is uniquely identified to those goals in your business with that business unit with that kind of central organization and trying to map that that all out um uh, uh so so a mix of having a level of method but really getting more intimate with what's what's the again the behaviors of what's going on in the organization already yeah so so i think when you're talking about that as a strategic approach up front um what what do you see or what what do your colleagues at fp consulting see in terms of the knock-on effects of not putting that in place not kind of standardizing things correctly yeah i mean i mean if we relate back to some of the conversation we were just having around um misunderstood buying behaviors or misunderstood um kind of ways to contract or um, manage statements of work or measure statements of work or get to outcomes they're all they're all symptomatic to some degree of not getting to uh, or not having a, a, a clear operating model in the first instance um, and roles and responsibilities we talked about that's a, yeah. that's a great great segue between that operational reality and the strategic conversation um, uh, so if you've not designed your operating model knowing how procurement needs to interact with the business and then you start trying to um, get into outcomes-based contracting <laughs> where everybody knows what their roles are I, I don't know how you really do that unless it's by coincidence. It's got to be a bit more of a scientific way of thinking to say procurement has decided it's going to work with the business in this way. That might be through category strategy, it might be through business partnering, it might be through just informal conversation, and then that's going to float the float using your term. It's going to flow down into that operational reality. Um, so, so I, th that's how I would how I would stitch the two together. There is a massive knock on effect. Um, uh, Operating models don't need to be seen as like the, the panacea of solving everything, but they should definitely be thought through if you're leading a large procurement organization in a company. Yeah, I, I love it. I feel like you've got a natural level of curiosity that you're going to delve into stuff and you're going to want to know the reasons why certain things happen. I think that, that, that in terms of what you're going to be doing moving forward and what you're doing now, um, you're really going to be able to exercise that, aren't you? Going to organisations and trying to unpack what they're actually doing and why. I hope so, Johnny. Yeah, uh, 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 I think um, uh, some of it's through experience of, you know, trying and failing on certain stuff. You know, putting in something prescriptive and then realising that something else different is completely going on, and then the market learning, changes market, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So some of it's by going through those those learnings of what's not worked, um, but also. I think um, certainly in the consulting uh, side of things, there is a tendency to um, uh, uh, to be quite conceptual, which is good because it can help elevate the conversation and take people out of the situation, but then not really want to be part of the change. And if you really want to be part of the change, as well as kind of marry marry the, the good strategic thinking together, you've got to you've got to get under the hood of um, of maybe somewhat unpopular conversations and or unpopular behaviors and you know again some of the stuff we've been discussing around procurement working with the business or the business buying what procurement sell that breakdown of communication is often behaviorally driven or something that's kind of happened as a problem in the past with how procurements work with the business so if you don't get into that conversation of maybe what's happened and then think of a path forward you're just putting you're just putting processes in place and sticking plasters in place to maybe some underlying things. So I think I, I think my curiosity is probably naturally born from recognizing that if you really want to make an impact in an organization, you can't shy away from getting your hands dirty with the change journey. Um, and, and you can't ignore previous problems. I, I love the fact you're just kind of saying, well, you know, not everything's ever necessarily gone a hundred percent in all cases. I think. Um, not having a defensive attitude is critical for the development of procurement functions within organisations and the development of, of it as an industry or as a um, yeah, a profession. Um, so 
so for example having conversations or conversations operating in the in the market where people are talking about what went well what didn't go so well i think it's just great i think it's so useful because what you don't want is necessarily like people from organizations to be engaging in conversation whether it's events on podcasts interviews whatever it might be um in publications where they're just saying we did this and we did a great job and that's it. It's, it's when people accept and go, well, you know, we did this and that didn't really work out and we learned this. It's, there's so much learning to be taken from it, isn't there? And I guess going on a consulting basis, you know, the, the maximum value an organisation can extract from that is being non-defensive and going, well, you know, to be honest, there was this and there was that and there were these things that didn't work out and what's the best way forward? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 personally, that's how I've learned. I've not learned through knocking it out of the park every five seconds. It's um, it's through uh, hopefully doing some good stuff, but at the same time, going through the going to the depths of really the low points that then realize how do you get out of that low point to get to something hopefully that's a, a bit more meaningful for that organization. Um, uh, you know, I think you talked about sustainability and kind of, you know, I think it's exciting all of us to some degree in, in our profession, but more broadly. Um, and, um, but back to where does sustainability play a role? Where does it not play a role? If you come in with a prescriptive way of thinking or with a market way of thinking, which is straight away jump into kind of decarbonisation and you know COP twenty two and whatever might is it might be um, uh, driving the conversation around that debate. That's for me. That's one part of the 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 ESG or environmental social governance equation really that's come about and we should be as professionals um working out how to pinpoint what's relevant to what part of procurement um so in a services capacity actually governance and um and uh social compliance is far more important than than some of the um uh, carbon reduction side of things so i think us getting used to unpicking unpicking maybe what the market's talking about is a crucial part of us having uh, that that uh, re relevant conversation, but also recognizing that you don't need to procurement doesn't need to be the same for every single organization. Yeah, it's not a generic uh, approach. It's not and, a generic and in and in your and, and in the approach to what's um, defined by the the market, the wider market as a whole, it's still got to be applied to that specific organization. Yeah, definitely. Um, you're going to be busy. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. I'll check my emails when yeah. this conversation. But, uh... but it sounds really exciting. I love it, and um, I, I I always appreciate it when people are doing things that are where are entrepreneurial and and I just love problem solving. Um, I think you know uh, the idea of um, wanting to stay static is something that I find very difficult to. It's not really my mentality. Mm -hmm. So so the idea of the the kind of problem solving exercises you're going to be going through and you're going to be taking organisations through, I think it sounds really exciting and um and hopefully very rewarding yeah f fingers crossed um yeah. if it all doesn't work out there's always the band you could go <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if you're allowed to say that um we've, we've probably been blacklisted somewhere at some point but uh yeah i, I you know everybody's got different strings to their bow I, I, you know i've uh, um i think that's important as well actually having a, a level of just kind of um perspective in life you know we problem solving is at the heart of what 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 certainly what I'm trying to do and what um, you know people around me have done in, in the past, and that's what keeps us excited. But you know, it's one part of life, <laughs> and yeah. I think I think uh, um, everybody's got different facets to their life as well. So, trying to get that perspective of doing something that's hopefully productive and contributing, and people walking away thinking we've we've made a, a meaningful change. That's that's one part of it, but not not the the detriment of everything else as well. Well, like you say, you know, that's that's incredibly rewarding as well. If you're going into organizations, you're giving them meaningful change, helping them execute it and taking them along the journey. Um, that's pretty rewarding. But you've got to think about family life, your health, all these things as well, haven't you? It's yeah. it's um, yeah. it feels like there's a lot more to balance or a lot more to think about and balance these days where I feel like when I first started out in uh, in employment, it was obviously I was younger and had zero responsibility, <laughs> but um, it felt um, much more prescriptive in terms of a kind of flight path. I know obviously the way that everyone works these days and the changes in that have, have had an effect on that, but um, it's almost like enabled people to have a bit more of a broader viewpoint on it in terms of how involved we want to be with our families and our kids and how you have to manage personal situations as well as uh, work. Yeah, yeah. I, I, 
probably get shot for saying this, but um, you know, I think the lockdown of the pandemic was was a bit of a blessing and a curse for a lot of people because it gave people that ability to remember what's what's important in terms of managing the balance of those elements and um uh you know um but at the same time i have to admit that coming out of that time was has been again really liberating for somebody like myself and probably somebody like yourself johnny where you know we want to get together with people we want to drive that change there's nothing better than meeting people face to face um uh you know when it comes to um uh you know moving things forward and progressing stuff um but at the same time, you've got to do that in tandem with everything else. So I think we we've gone through a, a, a large learning as a society, haven't we, of uh, of, of feeling that. Um, but but yeah, really excited about working with different organisations and companies, um, and um, and getting into that change mindset again. It's it's quite a quite an exciting space. Yeah, and like you say, and it's ultimately um, about meaningful outcomes, and you clearly got a, a desire to to bring about excellence. And I think you know that's um, there'll be there'll be some some great challenges along the way and great opportunities, but it's it's something where organisations can get a huge amount of value from increasing the um, the effectiveness of their procurement function. Yeah, um, and it's yeah, it's a, it's a massively um, exciting and evolving space at the moment. So yeah, really interesting, and uh, wish you all the best with that. Well, thank you very much, and really enjoyed it. Excellent. Well, thanks very much for coming in. Great to chat. Um, like you said before, I think there's there's loads more we could talk about. Maybe we'll have to do a round two at some point. <laughs> um, but yeah, I really appreciate your input, and um, yeah, great to chat. Yeah, likewise, Johnny. Cheers. Good.